our honorable speaker of the Meghalaya Legislative Assembly, all our honorable MLAs who are present here in this function and celebration, our Chief Secretary and all the officials of the government of Meghalaya, all the senior officials of the government of India, all our officials and our Jawans from the different armed forces and the different paramilitary forces, all the guests who have come here to be part of this very important celebration of Republic Day. And all my dear citizens who are participating or listening to this very important program and celebration. At the very outset, I would like to give my heartfelt greetings on the 73rd Republic Day to each and every individual who is here as well as to all the citizens of Meghalaya. Friends, this is a very, very special year for each and every one of us. Apart from being the 73rd Republic Day, we are also celebrating 50 years of our statehood. This year also happens to be the year where we, will be, we are celebrating the 75th year of our independence. At the same time, this is also the 125th birth anniversary of late Subhash Chandra Bose. So indeed, this year's celebration is very, very special to each and every Meghalaya and to each and every Indian. And I take this opportunity to wish and once again, give my heartfelt greetings to each and every one of you on this very, very important day. Friends, the last 50 years of our statehood have been extremely challenging. And while the challenges were there, it is the great leaders, distinguished individuals, our farmers, our youth, our entrepreneurs, our sportsmen, our musicians, and every single citizen has made Meghalaya what it is. We would not have reached this position if it, not, if it was not for the contribution that was made by the different governments. We would not have been here today if it was not for the contributions made by the different chief ministers, the different officials, bureaucrats, and each and every common citizen of our state. So I take this opportunity on this very, very auspicious and a great day for our country to wish and to thank each and every individual who has contributed to making this state and to making this country what it is today. Having said that, there are a large number of challenges in front of us. We have come this far 
We are doing what we have to do. But the question is, what can we do more to make Meghalaya a shining example of governance, a shining example of a society, a shining example to the rest of the nation and the world, that in spite of the challenges we face, Meghalaya can do more. We can achieve more. And we should never be satisfied with what we have now. And that is a real challenge. I remember in 2018, when we took over the government, we had huge challenges. We had a lot of problems with law and order, militancy. We had a situation where mothers were giving birth to children without any professional help. 50% of the mothers were giving birth to their children on their own. 50% in their homes. We had 40% children who did not receive any immunization. We had less than 30,000 people who were part of different, different self-help groups. We had projects in PMGSY which were due from 2001, not completed. And while I say that, I'm not here to point fingers. I've already said that everybody has contributed, but there were challenges. And when we took over the government, we looked at these challenges as a sense of motivation for us. You can look at a challenge and you can get tired of it looking at it and feel that we can't do anything about it. Or you can look at a challenge and say, I'm going to make a difference. And I will make sure that we will change it. Be inspired by it. Be motivated by it. And that's what happened to us in 2018. We were inspired. There was a system, a government, a process which was going on. But it was not able to deliver the desired results that we wanted. And hence the challenges. And therefore we took tough decisions. And let me be very clear that those decisions were not all correct. We are human beings. We may make mistakes in our decisions. We may sometimes make the wrong decision. But let me tell you, our intentions were always correct. We always kept the people first. We always kept our farmers first. We always kept our mothers first. We always kept our entrepreneurs first. And we made the decision in the best interest of our state and of the people of our state. We changed the style of governance. But there were times when projects were not monitored. We ensured that monitoring was being done. We ensured that reviews were taking place. I can tell you very confidently today that there are over 28,000 pregnant mothers in our state at any given time. And I'm happy to inform you that we actually know each and every one of them. We can exactly tell you under which sub-center PHC or which doctor is taking care of them, which ASHA is taking care of them. We can tell you that out of these 28,000 mothers who are pregnant, we can actually tell you that 10 to 15% are high-risk mothers. And we know their names. And we follow 
We ensure the doctors visit them, the ashas visit them, special care is given to them. And it is this monitoring that has today helped us to ensure that our institutional deliveries have gone up from 50% today to 85%. This is the difference in the governance that we are trying to make. We have accountability. Every single 548 PM GSY projects that are going on, we can tell you at any given time what is the current progress of the road. We can actually call up the contractor, which I do, and ask them why the work is going slow. And that today, has changed the entire implementation of PMGSY, where we are doing five times more projects than what we had in the last 10 years. There is teamwork. It's not a one-man show. It's a team that works. And I strongly believe that if you really want a system to work, you must identify good people, and allow them to work. If you do that, the system will work. It is sometimes the political interference that sometimes is counterproductive. Now, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. We are in a political system. But what is important to know that it is important that the team must work and we must allow the system to work. Today, because of the work that we have done, as I said, the institutional deliveries have today gone up by 35% from 50 to 85%. In terms of nutrition, we had a large number of SAM and MAM children, which is severely acute malnutrition children. And today, because of the monitoring and accountability that we have in the system, we are able to reduce it by over 90%. That is accountability. That is the governance that we are talking about. Today we have a program for farmers. We realize that farmers have been marginalized all these years. We talk of farmers, their contribution, the importance, but what have we done to actually help the farmer? And for the first time in the history of the state, the first welfare program for farmers has been taken up in the last 24 months, 12 months actually, in the last 12 months. And in this last 12 months, a new program called FOCUS, which is really to focus on the farmers, has been taken up. Where over 200 crores is going to be spent on four and a half lakh farmer fa families. Benefits will be given to them. And a direct benefit transfer is being done for the first time. With these funds, the farmers are actually able to meet their basic requirements that they need during difficult times. Similarly, we realized that if we really want to target and reduce the maternal mortality rate, which is one of the key areas for this government, I ask myself this question all the time. That while a mother is giving birth and bringing life into this world, why should a mother lose her life? And what is it that we can do to change that? Not easy. Not saying we can do it in one day or one year. But we can make a difference. And we realize that to do that, it's not just about the last minute health facilities, but it is a process that is involved. You need to economically empower women. You need to make them economically active. And once they are economically active and empowered, there will be more spacing between the birth. The women will be more active and hence, 
they will not be having delivery or birth every one year, every two years. There will be a, a, a gap. And these are all socially connected. We are all aware about it. And hence, we focused on the self-help group movement. We realized that we need to make our women more active. We went for a very strong self-help group movement. Today, close to three and a half lakh women are part of the self-help group movement, where it was just 30,000 when we had taken over. More than 1,000% it has jumped. And different self-help groups are now involving women and making them active. And this institution that has been set up of over close to 38,000 self-help groups is helping us not just in terms of the self-help group movement, but it is an institutional setup that helps us to even deliver COVID messages. It helps us to deliver different health messages different messages that are important for the community and society as a whole. It's an institutional setup that we have made. It is this governance that we have done in the last four years that has seen 4,000 families had pipe connection through water. Honorable Prime Minister mentioned this on, on the 21st of January, that in 2019, in the rural areas, there were 4,000 families or houses that had water through pipe. Only 4,000. And he has congratulated Meghalaya that today, within a matter of year and a half, in spite of the COVID challenges, there are over 2 lakh families today who now receive water through pipe touching almost 12 lakh individuals in the state. This is the kind of governance and focus that we have done. There was a time in 2018 when there was not a single flight that came out of Shillong. There's a big challenge because the entire mountain had to be cut. Huge investment had to be made because without that, the instrument landing system would not work. We took the bold decision to invest the money, chop up those mountains in order to ensure that connectivity improves to Shillong. And I'm happy to inform you, I'm happy to inform you that that decision that we took today has led to over seven flights coming to Shillong from different cities. Over 300 passengers coming in every day. And I can assure you that this connectivity will only keep increasing in the days to come. Connectivity is very important for our region. Today, a distance of almost 20 hours, 24 hours by road at a, at a point in time to Imphal is covered in less than 30 minutes directly from Shillong. This is the kind of connectivity that we require. As a state, we have huge challenges in finance. Though the state has its own revenue of close to 3,000 crores, though we have our own our central taxes of over 5,000 crores coming in, yet we do need the additional funds for infrastructure development and different economic growth. And that is the reason why we realized that we need to tap the external agencies. In 2018, there were 2,500 crores worth of projects going on under the externally aided projects. Today, after we have tapped the external agencies, we have been able to mobilize 7,500 crores from external agencies to do a huge number of projects in tourism, in water catchment area, natural resource management, road construction, integrated transport system, early childhood development program, and many other programs under the externally 
aided projects. And I'm very happy to inform you that because of the strong mobilization that has been done, today the state government's expenditure is close to touching 14,000 crores. When we were at a point in 2018 spending less than 9,000 crores. In a matter of four years, that has almost jumped up by 40%. And that is only possible because of the mobilization that has been done through external agencies. It's only been possible because of the implementation of the projects, timely implementation and uh, submission of UCs, getting the money from central government and running the centrally sponsored schemes in the most efficient manner. And it is with this effort today that this 50 years of celebration is truly going to be special. We are going to inaugurate 300 projects in this year. And these 300 projects include the new Meghalaya Assembly, a project that's been pending for almost two decades. But it is under the leadership of our speaker, late speaker, late Dr. Don Cooper Roy, and also the current speaker, Srimet Palindoji, where today we are seeing speedy implementation of this project. We had challenges. We had challenges. But in spite of that, I can assure you that in this year itself, in a few months from now, we will be inaugurating this project. In 2008, when I was the IT Minister of Government of Meghalaya, we had started the process of coming out with an IT park. I realized that investors want to come to Meghalaya because we have a human resource. But they don't want the headache of investing in the infrastructure and the building. What they call in tech term, they wanted a plug-and-play model. And therefore, it was important for the state government to make the investment, create the infrastructure, so that the IT companies would come to state, simply have to plug, start their process the next day. If they feel it's not working out, plug out, and they could leave. And therefore, the concept of an IT park came in. After 2009, this project was in the back burner. But as soon as we came back in government in 2018, we swiftly moved to ensure that this project would be completed on time. And I'm happy to inform you that on the 1st of February, we will be inaugurating the IT park. And this will be one of the best IT parks in the whole region, not just the state. And this will give opportunity of jobs to more than 1,500 of our youths. I also want to in inform you that this is just the beginning. We have 80 acres of land in that area. We intend to do much more. We will expand the IT park so that more and more jobs can be given to our youth. So that the youth who are having to go outside the state will be able to come back. We are over 150% booked in this current IT park. There's a huge demand. There's a waiting list of companies who want to have space in this IT park. We realize sports is important. And therefore, within this, financial, this year itself, the 50th year of our state, we will be inaugurating one of the best football stadiums, I should say, in the whole region, which is the PA Sangma football stadium in Tura. We will also be completing the upgradation of the Jawala Nehru Stadium, which is right behind us. We have also laid the foundation for the new administrative city. Friends, in the last 50 years, we have been functioning out of the same administrative setup in terms of the buildings in Shillong. 
And we have seen that Shillong has grown. It has become populated. We realize that until unless we don't expand the city, we will not be able to have the decongestion that we require. Shillong needs to expand. In the past, there was an effort to do that. But there were small bits and pieces of lands that were bought. It was not a contiguous piece of land. And hence, a planned city could not come out. So therefore, to change that, we have procured 807 acres of land in New Shillong area. And the new administrative township will come up in that area in the next 10 years. We will shift our different administrations, the secretariats, government offices, central government offices, so that the citizens will have to go to one location and they will be able to get all the services in that particular area itself. A place where there will be enough space planned properly, having a look of a modern city. And this is what Shillong and Meghalaya deserves. This is what our citizens deserve. We need to think big. We need to think of what we can be, not what we are. What we would want to be, not what others may say we are. And therefore, let this new administrative city be one of the best in the country. And that is what we want to do. And we will do it. In this next one year, for the first time, we'll be focusing on different infrastructure projects and administrative projects in the state. You go to our blocks, I think they've never been painted for the past, past 30 years. You go to our police stations, they've never been renovated for the past 30 years. You go to some of the LP schools, they don't have doors and windows and chairs and tables. And when I say that, I don't mean to insult anybody. These are facts which we need to face. And not just face, we need to do something about it. And therefore, I'm pleased to inform you that we have mobilized over 1,300 crores through a program called NIDA. This is a program under NABAR, where we will be giving funds of over 120 crores to build up new block offices in all the 40 blocks that are there. Close to 46 blocks, but six blocks they've already given. Another 40 blocks we will be giving three crores each to build new administrative setups and blocks in these old block buildings that are there. The different SP offices, the different police stations, we have earmarked to give 100 crores to different police setups to ensure that all these buildings are upgraded. We have funds for the PHC, CHC sub -tenters. Projects are going on as we speak. We will continue to strengthen them. We have schools, more than 2,000 LP schools. We have renovated close to 600 of them in the last two, three years. <coughs> we will continue to do another 200 to 300 schools in this year to this NIDA fund. Not just that, all the different administrative setups that have been created in paper but do not have enough infrastructures, like the new districts, the new subdivisions, the new blocks, we will be sanctioning money to make new administrative buildings in all these areas. And while we speak of administration, let me also assure you that there is need for more administrative expansion, especially at the block level. We realize that 70% of the services that the rural people need is through blocks. And there are some villages in our state where people have to travel 
more than two hours just to get that old age pension. Just to see whether the NRGS money has been transferred or not. Just to get some documents signed. It is not fair. And therefore, we have made a conscious decision that we will take steps to improve the accessibility of administration at the grassroots level and we will ensure that we create more administrative units that are required at the grassroots level. The border issue has been something that has been very, very critical for the state of Meghalaya and its people. In the last 50 years, after getting our statehood, we were not able to resolve the border issue. Many governments have tried. Many chief ministers have done their best. And I do take this opportunity to thank each and every one of them for their efforts. But when we came into government, we realized that in order to resolve this issue, we may not be able to do it if we keep looking through the same lens. We may need to look through different lenses also. And therefore, we started the process. We started the process by telling Assam and government of Assam and government of Meghalaya officials and leaders that let us not come to the negotiation table with positions. And when I say positions, say this is Meghalaya and this is Assam. If you have already come with that mindset and with that position, then the discussion is over before we start. So therefore, let's not come with a position but let's come with issues and our interests. What is it that matters to us? What is it that is important to us? Let us start looking at this issue from those lenses. The interest of our state and the interest of our people. And that is how we have been looking at the entire process in a different manner. Giving more flexibility to the discussion. But at the end of the day, while we base our discussion on issues and different points that we have, we must also have basic principles that we stick to. Now, if we are going to say that people's will is going to be applicable in this area, and we go to another area and in that area we say, no, people's will will not be applicable in this one. That is not fair. We must have the same yardstick for all the different areas. So therefore, we started with basically two pillars and principles. One, the interests of the people will be kept in mind. And number two, when we come out with principles, they should be applicable in all the areas. And therefore, while we are here at the almost at the end of being able to come to a conclusion to the six areas of differences, which I am sure that in the next few weeks we will be able to come to a conclusion. We have stuck with people's will. What is it that the people in that area want? If there is a population of a tribe from Meghalaya who is there, and though Assam may have documents and they claim it, can we force those people who don't want to go to Meghalaya, or go to Assam, can we force them and say, you have to go? Is it possible in today's world? These are not two different countries. This is one nation. 
Therefore, what was happening maybe 50, 100 years back, things are different. Therefore, people's will is important. And this has been one of the major principles on the basis of which we have moved forward in this discussion. Ethnicity of the people is important. The different areas of contiguity are also being looked into. So these different factors that have been there, but as I mentioned, the basic principles of people's will has been taken. And we have ensured that we don't stick to positions, but rather we stick to the interests that we have. And it is with this mindset today that we are close to solving six of the issues. And we will work to ensure that the rest of the six issues, based on the similar principles, are also taken up. Another very decisive step that was taken by this government was in 2019. There was a ban on coal mining. Our people have been mining coal in this manner, which the NJT banned. For the last hundred years, and before 2014, it was fine. And suddenly, in 2014, it was not fine. So therefore, coming in and completely stopping the mining, a process which has been going on for years, is not fair for the people. Like we are discussing about climate change. People come to India and to other developing nations and say, you have to stop the CO2 emission tomorrow. What does India say? That it is the developed nations that have caused all these issues in the last many years. India is just starting its process. You cannot just simply come in and tell us to stop. So therefore, a concept of just transition is coming in, which is justified transition. In coal mining also, we need justified transition. You cannot ask people that you just stop tomorrow. Therefore, we are working towards ensuring that we need to, number one, clear the fact that the ownership of this coal belongs to the people. And hence, we took the tough decision, knowing that there are challenges and the possibility of us losing the case. We realized that this is important for the people. We took the decision to challenge the NGT ban, and we were successful in lifting it. And now we are in the process of the just transition where we are ensuring that people are going to be able to mine in a scientific manner, respecting the environment, respecting the system, respecting the people. And therefore you will see that within this year of our 50 years, our golden jubilee, we will come out with scientific mining licenses which is under process as we speak. At the same time, in this very, very wonderful and beautiful year of 75 years of our independence and 50 years of our statehood, I must say something which is very, very important. We have seen many instances of communal violence. We have seen situations where individuals have been targeted. Of course, we know that this does not reflect the society. This may be incidents that are there. A particular individual might be doing this. But while this happens, as a society, we must reflect. We must reflect and see what we can do to change this one or two individuals. Not the society, but one or two individuals. And we need to realize that the messaging that we are giving is something that we need to look at. 
We need to realize that to showcase our patriotism, we don't need to be common. So therefore, it is up to us as a society to ensure that even these one or two stray incidents that are happening is something that should not be allowed, should be condemned. And as a society, as different organizations, we should take the responsibility to ensure that we respect each other while we fight for our identity, while we fight for our rights, while we fight for our people and our community. We must respect others also. As we move forward in the next many years, there will be a large number of challenges in front of us. Environment is going to be one of the biggest challenges we face. Climate change is real. And biodiverse regions like ours will be affected one of the most. Therefore, as a government, as a society, as a community, we must be prepared to face it. We must have adaptation plans. We must have mitigation plans. We must realize that small differences that we can make at our level to mitigate can be done even at individual levels. Small changes to adapt can also be done at individual levels. I urge our citizens to work on the different aspects of climate change. Our youth is our biggest strength and our biggest challenge. And therefore, for the first time, as a government, we have realized we cannot have interventions at certain periods in time. The youth needs to be molded. The youths need to be shaped. The youths need to be given a direction. The youth need to be kept busy. The youth need to be made productive. Therefore, waking up when they are 15 years old and 16 years old and saying, what is the youth doing? And kind of blaming them is completely incorrect. The youth want to do the good things. But it is the government, it is the society, it is the parents who may be failing in our duty in giving that opportunity to the youth. And hence, we have realized that it is not when they are 15 plus that we wake up and say that we have to do something about the youth. It starts from birth. It starts from the first thousand days we need to ensure that the right nutrition is given to them. It starts off with ensuring that the first few years until the age of eight, when the child's mind develops the most, when they are most receptive to different aspects, early childhood development must be done. We realize that adolescent girls need the counseling when they are just crossing the age of 10, 11, 12 before they touch adulthood. So we need a program for adolescent girls and boys. And of course we need a program for the youth once they're adults. How do we ensure that employment is given to them? So therefore, as a government, one cannot wait till they are 15, 16, 17, 18 and then realize that we have not done enough. Hence, for the first time, maybe in the region and maybe in the country, we will be having a detailed, comprehensive program for the youth from the day the child is born to the day of adulthood. Whether it is the first thousand days, whether it is the early childhood development program up to age eight, whether it's eight to 12 in the adolescent age, or whether it's 12 to 15 in the teenage, or whether it's 15 to 18 and 18 and above. We need a comprehensive program. And therefore, I'm happy to inform you that we will be taking these programs up. We have got over 300 crores 
from World Bank for the Early Childhood Development Program. We will be getting funds for the adolescent program also. We have started focusing in a mission mode on the first thousand days of a child's health and nutrition. We have started a youth policy that is ensuring that they will give in, youths will be given one skill and one talent. We have started working towards promoting entrepreneurship, promoting their industries, promoting the private sector, so that youths will not just be job seekers, but they will be job creators, and ensure that the 50,000 youths who are entering the workforce every year will be given job opportunities in the coming days and coming years. That is the kind of comprehensive youth program that we need to do. Similarly, for farmers, there is a huge number of farmers who need support. We are not able to give the support that they need on time. There are challenges. Agriculture department needs to give the seeds right before the rain come in. Areas are big, sometimes the seeds don't reach the farmers. Therefore, we need different programs and ways and means in which these micro challenges can be met. And therefore, focus program is just one of the programs that we have done. You talk of the different missions. Today we have turmeric Lakadong mission that's going on in our state. The Lakadong turmeric mission is one of the most successful missions that we are running. Where we have over now, at one point in time, 1,000 farmers were involved. Today we have close to 10,000 farmers who are involved in Lakadong. Where the annual income for the farmers was less than 8 crores. Today it's more than 35 crores in a matter of two years. Once we set up 15 processing plants, which is under process, and in the month of February or March, we are going to be having the Lakadong Festival, where we will inaugurate these 15 processing plants. And in the next one year, in this 50 years of celebration, the first curcumin extraction plant will be set up in Lakadong area in Jente Hills. The only one is in Bangalore right now. And curcumin is what really matters in terms of the pharmaceutical business and the value of the Lakadong that we have. Hence, if you are able to extract the Lakadong turmeric curcumin, which sells us almost 6,000 rupees per litre, the kind of value that will go to our farmers will not just double, but will go tenfold more. Therefore, friends, multiple challenges are there and huge opportunities are also there. We will move forward in spite of all the challenges we see in front of us. We will come out with more administrative blocks. We have given funds to the grassroots in terms of the center group movement, in terms of the focus movement. 3,000 crores is what the state earns from the resources and the taxes that we collect from the people of our state. There must be a certain percentage of these 3,000 crores that must go back to the people. And FOCUS program is one of the programs through which we are giving 200 crores to the farmers. We need to do more. 3,000 crores, taxes collected in terms of our own taxes. We will come out with more programs to ensure that these revenues that are collected the common people at the grassroots level, the BPLs, the, fa the farmers, and different people who are having a difficult time, especially in this COVID situation, will be benefited through different programs and schemes. We also realize that as a government, we cannot look at ourselves as a state only. If we need to grow, we need the science. If the Northeast region needs to grow, we need to present ourselves to the rest of the world as a Northeast market. We need to realize that the European Union, when they were formed, each individual state, country, had its own value. But put together, the European Union was a huge market. I strongly feel that for the Northeast region, 
for Meghalaya state to benefit, we must present ourselves as a region market to the rest of the world. Not just as a regional market, but we should also present ourselves as regional producers. We need to have global value chains developed. If some product is being grown somewhere, certain part of the processing should be done here. Maybe the packaging done in another part of the world, but a global value chain needs to be created. And until unless we are not able to give this picture to the rest of the world, we will face a challenge of being looked at as a state with 3.8 million people. And in a global scenario, that is a very, very small number. So therefore, Meghalaya has got its strategy cut out. But what will be Meghalaya's contribution in the growth story of the entire Northeast region? What will be the contribution of the entire Northeast in the growth story of the country? This is what we need to determine in the next five years, 10 years, and 50 years. And in the last four years, it is to achieve these goals and objectives that we have laid the foundation. We have laid the foundation for the next 10 years. We have laid the foundation to see that Meghalaya will become one of the top 10 states in the country in the next 10 years. And we will do it. We will do it. But we need to work as a team. We need to work as a society that works together. We need to realize that we need to move positively in the direction that we have set. So with friends, once again, I take this opportunity to thank all of you and wish all of you on this beautiful celebration of Republic Day we have. At the same time, this is the 50 years of our celebration uh, of our state, the golden jubilee of our state. Let us make this 50 years a great memory. This 50 years celebration will be a year-long celebration. And I, at this point in time, would like to mention that there were many people who contributed. I know that on the 21st of January, we were not able to give enough importance and credit to many individuals because there's so many of them. But I would like to take this opportunity to remember each and every one of them, to thank them, to those individuals who made the songs for our statehood, those individuals who were in prison for days and months because they loved their people so much. I thank them, I thank their families for their sacrifices. I thank the different organizations, many of them who have contributed to where we are today to get our statehood in that year. And I will assure you that as we go along in this next one year and we celebrate this 50 years, we will do our best to give recognition to as many as possible while we inaugurate these 300 projects that are there throughout the state. We will also involve these individuals and families and pay respects to these people who made our state happen. So with this, few words once again, I take this opportunity to wish each and every one of you a very, very happy Republic Day. Kublai, Mathela, and Jai Hind.